uh, this is Chu Yimar. Uh, you can also call me Annie. I'm a senior data scientist from Walmart, and I'm working on building machine learning algorithms to support decision making, especially for anti-fraud area. And today my topic is a semi-supervised anomaly detection system through ensemble stacking algorithms. And um, uh, uh, in this session, I will introduce this brand new anomaly detection system. And after this session, I hope my audience can understand that there are many different types of anomalies in reality and different types of anomaly detection techniques. And I will introduce this uh, anomaly detection system, which is flexible, systematic, and end-to-end -to, -end, uh, to address different types of anomalies. And also, I hope this um, brand new system can be generalized and to be applied in other domain as well. Uh, so first is the uh, motivation. So as a data scientist, I'm working with uh, in fraud detection area. So um, I'm talking about like anomalies or outliers all the time, but uh, what is anomaly uh, like technically? Um, so I read a paper uh, named Anomaly Detection a Survey uh, by Chandola, Benjani, and uh, Kuma, uh, which published on ACM Con Computing Service. It mentions that anomalies are like um, the in data that they do not conform a well-defined notion of uh, normal behaviors. So anomaly or outliers means they are like have patterns very different from the majority of the group. So, and this paper also categorized the anomalies into three major types. The first one is called point anomalies, which is a, like the most familiar one. It means an individual data instance can be considered as anomaly if they are like very far away from the rest of the data. So for example, uh, the, this plot I grabbed from that paper. Uh, so in this plot, uh, maybe O1, O2, and O3, those data points we can consider it as point anomaly because they stay very far away from the rest of the group. Um, so if we have anomalies like this, they are probably point anomalies. And the second concept is contextual anomalies. So it means only under some circumstances or under some like context, those data points will be considered as, uh, as anomalies. So for example, uh, in this plot here, uh, we have the monthly temperature uh, over time uh, from March to December. So if the low temperature happens in December, probably it is normal. But if the same temperature uh, have, uh, that we have it in June, probably it's kind of anomaly. So. So that means like certain uh, data points will be only considered as anomalies under some context. And the third definition is called collective anomaly. Uh, it means like a group of data uh, will be considered as anomalous with respect to the entire group. Uh, but maybe each individual of them will not be considered as anomaly. So for example, in this third plot here, the middle flat part, uh, we can consider it as a group of data which are all anomalous. But like if you pick single one of them, they will probably not be the anomaly. So um, we have so many different kinds of anomalies, but how to detect anomaly out of the normal population is a very challenging task uh, because first, it's hard to define the normal re like normal region that encompasses all the like possible normal behaviors. Second, uh, we know for anomaly detection we always have the lack of label problem. So uh, the availability of labeled data is a major issue. And next, uh, we know in like our real life the normal data always have some noise. So those noise that tend to be very similar with the uh, anomalies, so it's really hard for us to distinguish anomaly or noise. Um, then with the development of different anomaly detection techniques, uh, there are many algorithms 
like they are used for anomaly detection purpose. So in the same paper, it's also grouped the anomaly detection into like six major groups due to they have different assumptions. So the first one is classification based. It means we can have a classifier to distinguish between the normal and anomalous class. And the, this classifier can be learned in the given feature space. So examples are like uh, we have neural networks uh, to perform anomaly detection. For example, we can have the autoencoder to perform the anomaly detection, or we can have the Bayesian networks. We can have the regular like supervised learning method, for example, a support vector machine. Uh, we can also have some simple rule-based model. Um, and the second type is uh, nearest neighbor based. So this assumption is that uh, normal data only occurs in dense neighborhood, where anomalies, they are far away from their like, closest, closest neighbor. And for this method, we do require some uh, distance uh, metrics or like similarity measures. Uh, so examples like we have uh, k nearest neighbor, uh, we try to find k, like k nearest the neighbor to define the distance. Or we can have the uh, LOF, which is local outlier factor. Uh, so instead of find k nearest neighbor, we try to find the smallest hypersphere to circle those k nearest neighbors. Or we even have the improved version called connectivity based outlier factor. Um, and we have many actually uh, different methods fall into this category. And the third one is called clustering based. So uh, it assumes that normal data instance will uh, lie very close to their, um, uh, uh, will be very close uh, to each other, or they lie very close to their closest cluster centroid. But for anomalies, they will like, they probably do not belong to any cluster, or they stay very far away from their closest cluster centroid. Uh, so examples are like uh, we they are heavily used like uh, techniques for example DB scan or we have self organization maps or we have like k Um and next the fourth method uh, is the statistical based so it assumes that um, normal data instance occurs in high probability of a stochastic model while uh, anomalies they like occurs in very low probability of a, a stochastic model. So because statistical based, so we can have like parametric or non-parametric statistical model. Uh, so we can have like parametric, for example, Gaussian based models, or for time series, we can have like ARIMA or ARMA models. Um, and next category is called information theoretic based. So um, it assumes that anomalies will actually induce irregularity in the information context of the data set. So because it's information theoretical based, we do need some information theoretic me measure. For example, uh, we have Kolmogorov uh, complexity, we have entropy or relative entropy to define actually the information uh, theoretic measure. And lastly, we also have spectral based. Uh, that means we assume um, like data, uh, when data are embedded into lower dimensional uh, subspace, uh, then we can actually differentiate between the normal and the abnormal groups. Uh, so uh, the examples are like, uh, we have principal component analysis, PCA. Um, so total, we have like six, those different uh, types of anomaly detection techniques. And uh, in fact, most of the existing anomaly detection techniques solves only a specific formulation of the problem. Uh, so the idea comes to us is that um, how about like we just build multiple uh, anomaly detection techniques and we try to collect as much information as possible and there, maybe we can reach out to different uh, multiple experts to get an answer. So um, before we talk about the um, actual system I'm building, I really want to spend some time to um, talk about the problem background and the challenges we uh, am facing uh, when I doing the anomaly detection in retail industry. 
So, uh, like, for retail, uh, re giant retailer for, like Walmart, um, like we do generate enormous amount of daily uh, transaction data. So we have like a large amount of customer shopping or re return record. Uh, so we are facing a very huge data set. And also because we have big data sets, so anomalies are like still then labeled because human manual review is not visible. It's too expensive to have human to label different activities. And also <clears throat> because human activities are complex, so the anomaly patterns can be very fast changing and they do not conform to a well-defined notion. And lastly, as I mentioned before, uh, each anomaly detection techniques, they have their specific assumptions or formulations. So if we apply single one of them, maybe they will have some limitation. <clears throat> and next, um, so we, and the idea come to us is that uh, why we just apply the ensemble kind of idea to make use of uh, several different anomaly detection algorithms at the same at the same time, and then come up with the prediction based on different uh, algorithms. Then we actually propose a systematic, flexible, and end-to-end -end, uh, anomaly detection architecture to augment the existing labels and detect anomalies. So why we want to use this um, anomaly detection system? Uh, first we want it to automatically and intelligently detect unknown anomaly patterns instead of building, uh, like depending on human manual review. Because as I mentioned before, uh, human labeling can be very expensive and, and not visible. And second, we really want to enhance the real-time anomaly detection uh, system by enriching the existing labels with more meaningful signals. And third, because this system is systematic end-to-end -end and very flexible, so we can incorporate like different uh, algorithms into it, and it can be introduced to address different types of anomalies at the same time with low cost. So next, uh, I will talk about the uh, actual architecture I use for the new uh, system. So first, we feed the system with some uh, data inputs. So in my case, it is some transaction-based events. Uh, actually, it can be other events as well. And next, instead of building only one anomaly model, uh, I build like a plurality of different individual anomaly models. So it can be anomaly model one, two, and two X. And then I use an algorithm called ensemble stacking algorithm to uh, combine all different outputs from those anomaly models and to generate one unified anomaly score. And I use this score to uh, like intelligently detect unknown patterns as new signals um, and combine with the old or old signals. And I rebuild the uh, supervised model and to do real-time scoring. And here is the uh, architecture example I used for my own experiment. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm dealing with uh, some transaction-related events, so uh, it consists of some transaction-level features. And in this uh, example system, I built three different anomaly detection models. Uh, I use Gaussian-based models. I also use a uh, tree-based isolation forest, and I also use neural network-based autoencoders uh, to do an anomaly detection. And after I build these three uh, different models, um, I actually combine all the model outputs into one unified anomaly score uh, by the ensemble stacking algorithm. And then I use the uh, unified score to do uh, label augmentation, to augment the existing label, to have more bad signals. And I use both the old signals and the, the new signals from the system. And uh, I uh, train a final supervised model. In my case, it's a, a GBM-based model. 
And for this anomaly detection system, it contains three, uh, like six major modules. Uh, first, we have data preparation step and followed by anomaly detection modeling. Uh, then anomaly detection model evaluation. And then we generate a unified anomaly score. Uh, based on score, we do label augmentation. And then finally, we do supervised model training. And actually the middle four parts, anomaly detection modeling, anomaly model evaluation, and the generate unified anomaly score and label augmentation. Altogether, they called uh, a given name called ensemble stacking algorithm. And the first step is the data preparation. So it's very simple and uh, straightforward. Um, in my experience, as I mentioned before, I use transaction related events in E subscript I. So it's an n dimensional vector containing uh, like transaction level features uh, xi1 to xin. And then uh, if I have big N of this such uh, kind of transaction related events, I can have a data set of events, big E. Uh, then like uh, for the data preparation, I need to prepare three major trunks of data. The first one is for anomaly detection training. Uh, basically it's, it, it is used for the uh, like anomaly detection uh, system and it will like aug augment more like bad signals. So uh, I use three months of transaction events and it only contains normal events. And second step is for label augmentation and the supervised model training. Uh, in this data set, I use three more months of like transactional events and uh, it contains both both normal events and anomaly events. And I will flip some of the normal events to uh, anomalous in this step. And the third one is out of time testing. I pick another like different months for uh, out of time testing. And for the testing data, it also contains both normal events and anomalous events. And here is the actual uh, ensemble stacking algorithm I used for my uh, system. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, we feed the, the, the system with some transaction level events. And then we build L different anomaly detection models. Uh, I call it a set of M. So set of M is a, a set contains uh, L different anomaly detection models. Uh, so it can be many different models. It can be Gaussian based, it can be isolation forest or any other types of anomaly detection model as I mentioned before. Um, and for this step, uh, because uh, we are building different individual models, uh, so pre-processing step can be varied based on different model. Uh, and uh, like for example, feature selection or dimension reduction can be applied if needed. And after we build those um, candidate sets, uh, we know that not all of them are performed very well. So we need to select top K models with like the top performance using a unified evaluation matrix V. So um, the evaluation matrix uh, can be like commonly used one, for example, we can use a UC score or F1 score, F2 score or F beta score. Um, to we just pick one of them and to evaluate our anomaly detection models. And then we will generate the anomaly score based on each model. Um, so for model M1, we can have score S1. For model ML, we can have score SL. And because uh, those models are different, so we might generate different anomaly scores. They can be probability based, they can be loss based, or they can be error related. Uh, so because they are different, they have different distributions. Uh, they can have long tail or they can have bell shape. Uh, it is not uniform. So we need to actually compute the skewness for those different anomaly scores uh, using the formula here. Um, so we try to understand so how skewed the distribution is and we will apply some uh, 
like log transformation if needed it's too skilled um uh, and after that we will generate a normalized anomaly score so we will do normalization for those scores and uh, finally we get a, a model score set z so v1 to vl for different models and next step is we will generate the unified anomaly score uh, so and um, we call the unified anomaly score U. So it is a summation of different normalized scores times their weight. So the weight is defined, is like proportional to their uh, evaluation matrix. So if, if the model is more like powerful, so it will have more weight. And after this steps, we will do the label, label augmentation based on the unified anomaly score. So we can, like have a flip rate and uh, correspondingly we can have a cutoff for the unified score and then we do the label augmentation and in this flow chart actually the uh, there are four major modules as i mentioned before the first one is uh, anomaly detection modeling and the second one is anomaly model evaluation and this step is generate unified anomaly score and the last one is label augmentation. And for my own experiment, uh, as I mentioned before, I use three different uh, anomaly detection models. The first one I use is the commonly used Gaussian-based model. Uh, it has very strong assumption that data comes from Gaussian distribution, and the, the distance of a data instance to the estimated mean is the anomaly score. So the anomaly score in this case is the like distance based. And the second one I use is the uh, isolation forest. Uh, it's also very simple and straightforward. Uh, so it assumes that tree partition produce noticeable shorter parts for anomalies uh, because first there are fewer instances of anomalies resulting in smaller number of partition, uh, like the, the shorter paths in our tree structure. And instances with distinguishable attribute values are most likely to be separate in early partitioning. And the third model uh, I used is the uh, neural network-based autoencoders. So uh, as we know, autoencoders try to like compress the data into lower latent layer, and then it tried to reconstruct the original outputs. Um, so if for our normal data, it will generate very low uh, reconstruction error, but for anomalies, the error can be very high. And next is the example evaluation matrix I use for my uh, system. So um, here I use the F2 scores because I want more emphasis on the record. Uh, so um, I use F2, which is a combination of precision and record, but more emphasis on record. Um, and based on this matrix, I plot the pre precision and the record curve and to find the optimal value for F2 scores uh, used as my cut cutoff. And then is the label augmentation part. So after I choosing the cutoff for my uh, unified anomaly score, uh, so I plot this confusion matrix. And um, there are some data that uh, are normal in the past, but it will be considered as abnormal after the uh, anomaly detection system. Uh, for example, uh, the 24K, uh, out of them are like uh, potential uh, anomalies that their label can be possibly flipped in my future model training. And uh, finally is the uh, out of time model performance. So based on the final supervised model I trained, uh, I ordered the model score from highest to lowest, and then I give like cut them into 100 bucks. So in that way, I can have top 1% of the model score, top 2% of model score, etc. And the y-axis is the incremental anomaly capture rate compared to my old model. So for example, uh, under one, like for the top 1% of the model score, 
the old model, uh, the new model can actually capture 13.45% of anomalies than the old model. And also for top 2% of the model score, uh, my new model can capture 36.17% more anomalies than the old model. And also for the top 3%, it can capture like 44.81% more anomalies than the older model. So which means uh, my new system really give me like give my new model like more incremental capture for the anomaly. And final part is about some reference I use in this uh, in this experiment. And you guys can feel free to have a look if you are interested. And other than that, I think that's all for my session. And I think we can move to the Q&A part, if there is any. One of it is, um, can, can you explain a little bit more on why we use autoencoder here? Uh, yeah, I think I can uh, start with this one. So um, first, uh, autoencoder is a uh, deep learning based model. So it can address like many different features simultaneously. So it's like we know deep learning are more powerful uh, so, uh, compared to the traditional machine learning method, especially when the data set is very big. And so I choose the autoencoder because its capability to like compress data into latent vector and to capture the mean uh, like underlying features representations for my normal uh, groups and then try to reconstruct the uh, original input. So um, in my experience, it do have like pretty good performance because I have very large data set and a very like large number of features. Uh, hope it answer your questions. Uh, and the second one is uh, asking about is the anomaly detection model step unsupervised or are there any labels already know? Yeah, I can answer this one. Actually, we do have very few uh, labels already in that uh, data set uh, based on like some historical uh, kind of experiment. So this model is more like uh, semi-supervised. So we try to augment more bad labels, um, but we do have very few existing label already. Um, and I think the next one is about, uh, do you pass all the data points into all these three models? Consider the data size. This could be very computational heavy and time consuming. Or do you have some pre-step to decide which data points are passed to specific model? Uh, yeah, For so for this one, um, for all the individual anomaly detection model I built, I do pass the same amount of data set. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, because they have different assumptions, we I do apply different kind of pre-processing steps. So uh, they can be a little bit different, but they do use the same amount of data. Um. So what recommendations can you give to balance the samples when there are very few cases of anomalies. So I think you are talking about the uh, imbalanced data set problems. So I think we just, uh, for me, I just use the normal kind of an imbalanced data set handling, uh, like uh, the different sampling techniques, or like I give different uh, weight to my features. Uh, so, um, yeah, and also I think uh, one of uh, the model I use is autoencoder, and I think it also um, can address this kind of imbalanced kind of problem because we only look at the normal data. Uh, actually, for all the anomaly models uh, in my data set, we only look at the normal data. So, uh, if the uh, if there are some like uh, uh, data coming to the system but have very high anomaly scores, we can consider it as anomaly. Um, 
Um, I think the next, next question is, uh, can, can we parallelize the model um, so we can optimize its performance and capture anomalies? Uh, yes, we can. I think uh, because each individual anomaly model, they are separate, so they can be trained simultaneously and we can parallelize. Thank you much for joining this session. Bye. Bye.